Today I'm talking via Skype to uh, David K. Johnson, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, writer. Uh, he's written several books, uh, and um, including, wait a minute, I have it here, I've read them too, uh, Perfectly Legal, uh, Free Lunch, and uh, The Fine Print, How Big Companies Use Plain English to Rob You Blind. Um, and we're, hi, David. Hi. Hi. Glad we to be here. I'm, I'm so glad you are here. Um, we're, we're talking today, ladies and gentlemen. It's it's October 1st, uh, 2013, as we tape this. The the government has been in a semi-shutdown for uh, less than 24 hours. Uh, I Because, as, as I understand it, the congressional Republicans want to uh, stop the funding for the Affordable Care Act. Um, can David, can you talk to us about this and about what that the American healthcare industry and sure. and the uh, the way it runs. Sure, um, the Affordable Care Act will mean that millions of people who are unable to get health insurance because of a pre-existing condition or because they don't have enough money but they work will have access to health care. And the very right-wing Republicans know that they have to stop this, and the reason they know it is a lesson we can take from our own history in 1965 and from Canada five years before that. In 1965, we got Medicare, medical care for older Americans. Ronald Reagan famously gave a speech saying our children would discover their freedom had been lost if we had Medicare. There were doctors groups like the Medical Society in Ventura County, California, outside Los Angeles, who said that this was you know, part of the effort to move us toward being some sort of communist state and would destroy the country. And of course, what happened is uh, older people's lives have been extended because they got medical care under Medicare. It's a very popular program. And the, the, uh, the other lesson, the one from Canada, is about Tommy Douglas. Tommy Douglas was a Canadian politician from out in the plains. He's the politician who got Canada national health insurance. Every other modern economy in the world except the United States has universal national health coverage. And when the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation did a uh, uh, popularity contest a few years ago, who is the most important Canadian who ever lived? The winner, hands down, nobody else in the same league, Tommy Douglas. Now the far right in America will tell you, oh, the terrible socialized medicine in Canada. Well, one of my eight children is emigrated to Canada. Uh, she loves her health care. I went to Canada repeatedly for research on one of my books and interviewed Canadians. And like everything else, it's not perfect, but it's an awful lot better than health care in America, where currently nearly 50 million people have no health insurance, and another roughly 30 million have health insurance for only part of the year. So to the far-right Republicans, already facing demographics working against them. They are slowly becoming the party of angry, affluent white people who come from the South or behave as if they do. Uh, this is a real problem because if the Affordable Care Act succeeds, and it will, it's going to mean a great shift of support away from their views and toward the views of President Obama and people like him. It, 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 uh... Well, it's. I, I thought you know when the Affordable Care Act was passed, I thought, well, it's it's the industry is getting a big boon. I mean, I know that they're worried that down the line it's going to fruit, uh, you know, socialized medicine, but uh, and 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 it's very important for American industry to be able to compete to have uh, medical and, and care. And we we aren't competing. Let me give you just a killer fact that I wrote about when I was the worldwide economics columnist for Reuters a, a year ago. For every dollar per person in what are called purchasing parity equivalent dollars. So you adjust for the fact that conditions in Argentina and, and other places are not the same as here. Purchasing power parity dollars. For every dollar per person that the other 33 modern countries of the world spend and get universal health care, America spends $2.64. Uh -huh. Well, that makes us uncompetitive. It is the single biggest drag on our economy right now. 
And the very biggest corporations, General Electric, General Motors, Ford, they're not particularly affected by this. They are able to buy healthcare at prices that are roughly equal to what we would pay for a universal system because of their size. But if you're some of my neighbors here in Rochester, New York, who own businesses and employ somewhere between 20 and 3,000 people, you pay a premium price for your health care. And if you have business in numerous locations, you have to manage multiple jurisdictions. And at the same time, we have a system that for all sorts of reasons drives up health care costs, drives up physician incomes, adds costs, and creates an inefficient uh, a medical delivery system, which I don't, by the way, think is a system. I refer to it as a non-system sick care operation designed to maximize profits for the insurance companies. So, I, I mean, I don't know if you can speak to this, but I, it, it, it's curious that uh, it, from what you're saying, this it, the, 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 the very right-wing Republicans uh, knowingly or unknowingly, probably knowingly, are dancing on the strings of really big business uh, really big business is uh, is in the catbird seat when it comes to continuing the kind of health care system we have now. Everybody else is, or the smaller businesses, as, as well as individuals, uh, suffer under this system. Yes, although I, I think that the opposition by the right-wing Republicans, frankly, is just racism and classism. Um, uh, you know, you listen carefully to the rhetoric, rhetoric of the right-wing Republicans. It's been wrapped up ever since Ronald Reagan launched his campaign for president of the United States in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and racism. Now, Philadelphia, Mississippi is, of course, where the three civil rights workers were tortured and murdered yes. by the local racist sheriff. And when Ronald Reagan was asked why he would launch his campaign for president there, he feigned any knowledge of this and was shocked. And, of course, <laughs> let's assume that's true. Whoever have you heard of who goes to a little town in Mississippi to announce they're running for president? This was a coded signal to the racists out there. And opposition to universal health care is completely tied up with the remnants of the Old South, the people who do not want to sit next to people whose skin color is not like theirs in a restaurant or a hotel or on an airplane, who cannot in polite society say that. They will get in trouble with their employers if they say that. So, of course, up until the election of Obama, they diverted this energy into attacking the liberal news media. That was code for, I don't like the civil rights movement. Now that we have a black president, they're much more open and straightforward about it. That's really what's at the core of this, is racist views. And the news media, where I spent almost 50 years of my life, unfortunately, just doesn't call these people out and focus on that very much. So the, 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 the racism, uh, I mean, of course, it manifests itself in many, many ways, but it continues to be uh, utilized by, uh, it continues to be clung to by working class people who, who and these policies are fly in the face of their well-being. Oh, that's right. Yeah, no, clearly, listen, look at all the people you can see appearing on, on Fox News and who are on right-wing radio who, uh, you know, are politely called low-information voters who believe they're going to lose their health care, who believe that they're going to be denied health care, who believe that we will create death panels. And as I showed in my book, Free Lunch, we have death panels in America. We've had them for a long time, but they're corporate death panels. And we literally, literally pay bonuses to doctors who deny care to people who they doctors know that denial of care will result in their premature death. And I had congressional testimony I cited about this and, I, and told about it and named the doctor, one of the doctors in my book, Free Lunch. I know you're not a seer or anything, but I, I can't resist this. I mean, now that, we, now that we're pretty clear via DNA that there's no such thing as race right. uh, and uh, the, lots of racism, but no such thing as race. And now that, that the generations that are coming up will begin to accept this, uh, I would think more and more, we'd have to rise... We'd have to we'd have to link these inequities in another way. We'd have to you know we'd have to separate who you know who washes the shirt and who wears the shirt on some other basis. If this if this attitude of human beings towards each other is going to continue, you well, know. Ra race is a race is a construct. There's no question. Race is a construct. It is peculiar because of the history of the United States to this country. I remember, there was a time when we were told uh, uh, that if we didn't have slavery 
the economic system would collapse, just as we're being told that if we have universal health care, the economic system will collapse. Hopefully over time, and it won't be in a straight line, but this will become less and less of an issue in America. It takes time. It takes multiple generations. By the way, Lenore, there's a number I meant to mention that I think kind of will surprise people about how inefficient our health care system is. Mm -hmm. The best health care system in the world, in the view of the United Nations, World Health Organization, and others who have studied this, is the French system. I've used the French system while visiting there when I got sick. It is stunningly efficient and smooth with very little paperwork, unlike America. In 2010, if America had had the French health care system, we would have had universal coverage. And you know how much money it would have saved us? It would have saved us the same amount of money that all of us paid in federal income taxes. In other words, a universal health care system, all else being equal, we could have gotten rid of the individual income tax for the year 2010. And for this year right now, we could cut uh, uh, the income tax by about two thirds if we had that system. Now we'd be running big deficits if we did that. But my point is that's how much we're wasting. We're wasting six percentage points at least of our economy and the income tax brought in in, 19, in 2010, just a hair over 6% of our economy. Is it the, it, as I understand it, the healthcare insurance industry is huge. It's 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 one of the largest. Oh, it is it is unbelievably huge and, and it completely sells useless. itself as being an essential industry. It's completely superfluous. We have no need for it. But here's one of the worst things about it: it's all subsidized by taxpayers. In in the same book I mentioned before, Free Lunch, I tell about uh, a married couple and a single doctor in California who became billionaires with gifts of taxpayer money through this system. And one of them, bless his soul, before he died, wrote a book in which he said, you know, this is awful. I shouldn't have been able to do this. We should have universal health care. I'm glad I made all this money, but it's really terrible public policy. Uh-huh, uh-huh. A traitor to his class, as they would say. A traitor to his class. Um, so listen, can you tell us a little bit more about how uh, the tax system works uh, in, in terms of who gets taxed uh, sure. for, for what, and sure. then later on what 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 happens to this big pool of our of our of our of our money, aka taxes. Well, what Reaganism has been turning our tax system into, and every president, including the two Democrats in the White House since 1981, has been to some degree a Reaganite. Obama and Clinton are to some degree Reaganites. Yeah. What they have been slowly doing is converting the income tax system into a wage tax system. So workers, whether they're CEOs or janitors, have the taxes taken out of their paychecks before they get their money. But if you are a business owner, an investor, a landlord, you are trusted by the government to honestly report your income and pay your taxes subject only to audit. And one of the stories my Pulitzer Prize citation mentions is when I showed that in the year 1999, the IRS was more likely to audit you if you made less than $25,000, that is if you're the working poor, than if you made more than $100,000, that is you're affluent or rich. Mm -hmm. And this is a direct result of government policies. Now the principle of progressive taxation, which by the way, George W. Bush said he supported thoroughly, said he did, uh, is 2,500 years old. And the creation of the moral basis for progressive taxation is intimately connected with the creation of democracy in ancient Athens. The idea was that if we're all equal politically, and just because you have more money, you shouldn't have more of a voice, then you have to look at the tax system and you say, well, wait a minute, it's civilization that made your riches possible, whether you inherited them, whether you got them through luck or war or through business and smarts. However you got your money, the fact that you have it and that it's safe and that the system protects it means that you should bear a greater burden if you have a greater economic gain. That principle has been endorsed now for 2,500 years by every worldly philosopher from Aristotle to, of all people, Milton Friedman. Uh-huh. 
Milton Friedman wasn't big on highly progressive taxes, but he absolutely believed taxes should be progressive. In fact, John Locke, in very mild form, favored progressive taxation because he wrote that you can't tax the poor, they don't have anything. That's a progressive system. You don't tax the poor, you tax everybody else lightly. It's not very progressive, but it's progressive. And we've lost sight of that. We literally now have academic literature saying, well, you know, the way to grow jobs is to eliminate taxes for the job creators, the very wealthiest people out there who are creating jobs. Well, they're not job creators. Very wealthy people are job destroyers. I'm a job creator. I founded a business that had 20, has 25 employees every year at its peak. Uh, my sons now run that business. This is nonsense. Jobs are not created by wealthy people. Jobs are created by economic demand, and that comes from having enough income that people can buy goods and services. That 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 comment that you just the the, the story of the this idea of of progressive taxation and 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 if you've got enough if you if you're if you're secure financially uh, and your money's being protected by the civilization if I'm you know of course paraphrasing That's right. then uh, then uh, you, you owe a certain amount of this you know for the for that for that work for that for that the, the greater your gain the greater the burden you should bear and paying more dollars in a flat tax system actually reduces your burden. I mean, imagine you make $10,000 a year and the government takes $1 from you in tax. Well, that could be the difference between eating and going hungry or walking to work on the last day or taking the bus. But if you have an income of $100 million or a billion dollars, and we have at least 25 people in America every year now who make a billion or more a year, uh -huh. and we take $1 from you or 1% 1 per 1 of your income, it's in, 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 it's absolutely irrelevant to your life. Uh, economists call this marginal utility. And so the greater your income, the less each additional dollar means to your life, and the more under the classic conservative idea of progressive taxation, the greater the tax rate you pay should be. It, I guess what's so, what, what was particularly striking to me was this this idea of, of, of responsibility towards towards the society as a whole. Uh, it, it's it seems such an anathema to the atmosphere that uh, that I'm getting in the world that I live in now. You know, it it it. it well, well, you can blame in good part um, Margaret Thatcher and Milton Friedman for that. Both of them said in different ways, um, "We're not a society." Uh, Friedman said, "You know, we're." several hundred million people who share the same real estate. Um, I, I think that is an absurd and bizarre way to view the world. Uh, I think human beings have always been social animals. Um, in large part, I think they're herd animals. They tend to follow leaders. That's how Reagan was able to completely change the country. Whatever you think of Ronald Reagan, whether you love him or you hate him, Ronald Reagan was an extraordinarily effective leader who changed the direction of this country. And uh, uh, this idea that you don't have any obligation for anybody else. It's all for you. I did it on my own. Uh, that is an anarchist idea. It's one that no real conservative would actually support. But radical, uninformed people, uh, 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 people who I, I talked to a number of them in Congress who have absolute certitude about what they believe, but whose words demonstrate they have no idea what they're talking about, uh, embrace these ideas. Yes, yes. I mean, the, can you can you talk for? I mean, uh, if if Adam Smith said, you know, things like, you know, all 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 wealth must be must be measured at all times, something like that, uh, uh, but by labor. You know, here's the tree. The tree's worth nothing until you make something out of the tree, uh, sell it, da da da. So, can you, uh, sure. using, well, can, Adam, you can you Adam talk Smith to the relationship a, a, between wealth and poverty? How sure. how wealth Adam, is created? Adam Smith promoted an idea which Abraham Lincoln bought into very heavily, called the labor uh, value theory, and the idea is that you own a factory. Boy, that's great. Except that there's no labor to do the work in the factory. It's not worth anything. You have to have labor to perform the work. Now, Smith taught that all wealth grows from land and, and stocks, by which he meant you know, the, the capital you have to apply to a business. But he also argued that there's a symbiosis here. 
It's just like blood flow in your body, which is what he started studying before he wrote The Wealth of Nations. If you only have venal blood flow and no arterial blood flow, you're going to die. If you have what a minute, what does that mean? Venal in or in going in and one out way of your and body. right. The uh, arterial blood flows out, the venal blood flows back after it's done its job of distributing oxygen and and food, and has now picked up waste products and carbon dioxide to take out of the body. And if those are not in balance, you're not healthy. Well, we've created a society in which we are redistributing upward at a tremendous rate. And what's happening is we're becoming a sick society. We have all these people at the top with unbelievable fortunes. I mean, Mitt Romney, who's alleged, alleges he's only worth a quarter billion. I think he's worth about a billion dollars. But let's accept his quarter billion dollar figure mm -hmm. and $22 million annual income. He is at the bottom of the 1% of the 1%. He has a $22 million a year income, a yearly income? Right. But that's nothing. Among the very wealthy in America, he's at the bottom of the pile. Uh -huh. uh, we have people in America who year after year after year have billion-dollar annual incomes. And by the way, they don't pay taxes legally because the way Congress has written the rules, so long as it builds up inside their business, so long as they don't sell their investments, they don't pay taxes on them. If they're private equity managers like Mitt Romney was, they are allowed to defer all of their income into the future. And if they need cash, they just borrow against their assets. Right now, you can borrow for less than 2% if you're well-to-do. And the lowest tax rate is 15%. So, of course, anybody very wealthy would borrow against their assets instead of realizing income under the tax system. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I need to understand this a little. So they, they have a bunch of money, right? And they, right. that's in their assets and they borrow some money against that and they pay they pay back. The, and that's cheaper than what's the alternative? Then, then if you sell a stock or a business and you would have to pay taxes on your gain and you don't have to do that. And, and you never pay it back, by the way. Imagine you had a billion dollars. You suddenly found out when Northern yesterday, Uncle Morty left you unbeknownst to you a billion dollars. Uh huh. The financial advisor that you talk to, if they're any good, is going to say, listen, you don't have to pay taxes anymore. Here's what we're going to do. How much you want to live on? And you go, I don't know, $10 million. And you say, okay, we're going to borrow $10 million. You're going to pay the bank at the end of the year. You're going to own $200,000 interest. But you're not going to pay that because we're going to have grown your billion dollars to a billion, 100 million. We're going to borrow another $10 million. Now you'll owe the bank $20 million plus interest. But your fortune grew by $100 million. You're $80 million ahead, and you didn't pay any taxes. So you just, pay off, you just pay off the bank. I, I, just, just so, I'm, so you just pay off the bank with the, with the, with the piece of the vigorish that's... that's... You, you never pay off the bank. You just keep getting a new loan from the bank. Mamma mia. Oh, yeah. And, and, and people like Warren Buffett. Now, Warren Buffett is supposed to be the world's greatest investor, right? Yeah. He has a net worth that Forbes put a couple of years ago at $64 billion. His income that year was $64 million. If you believe that reflects the value of his investments, he's the worst investor in the world. That means he earned a fraction of 1% on his investments. In fact, what happened is Warren Buffett didn't want to have any income at all. He only takes $100,000 salary for running Berkshire Hathaway. But he had what I call incidental income. There were companies he owned stock in that were uh, sold and they paid in cash. There were dividends, some companies that he owned stock in paid. So he had to take this incidental income and pay taxes on it. And he paid exactly what I predicted would be the figure when he publicly announced it. I said he'd pay 17.1%. He paid 17.2%. Um, but, but Warren Buffett's real income that year was well north of a billion dollars. It just wasn't recognized by the tax system the way your paycheck is. We have uh -huh. two systems of taxation in America, separate and unequal. One for the plutocrats who get to live tax-free or virtually tax-free, and one for you and me, where the taxes are taken out of our check before we get paid, and we're very heavily taxed compared to people like Warren Buffett. And the, and the people that we're electing in the government maintain this, these policies. Yes, and, they, and in, in many cases, they have absolutely no idea what they're doing. I mean, I've interviewed over 100 members of the House and Senate over the years about these things, and it's very clear to me that many of them 
uh, have no clue to how the tax system works. And to be fair, I had no idea until when I went to work for the New York Times, I suddenly had 50 hours a week to study the tax system and learn how it really works. But now they know how it works. Uh, well, hopefully, um, uh, you know, I know that President Obama's read my books, but I somehow doubt Eric Cantor has. Uh-huh. Yes, I, I see. But I mean, it's 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 not I mean, they have advisors. And I guess I, what I'm saying is that it's. Yeah, but their advisors who are advising them are people who are also raising money from the wealthiest Americans. You cannot, Lenore, get your congressperson on the phone in all likelihood. Most people can't. But if you're a billionaire, you've got your congressperson on speed dial. Yeah, I, I, I guess what I'm what I'm what I'm dancing towards is the is the is the moral issue is the is the is the you know if we put aside the ignorance and we you know we we we, we people are no longer ignorant on this and yet doing this you know this these sort of criminal activities we're about a minute and a half away from uh, the end of the well, show. I, I wouldn't call them criminal because they're that's why I called the first book in the series perfectly legal. Uh, the underlying problem is that. We have very wealthy people, not, not all of them are like this, but most of them are. They don't want to pay taxes. They certainly don't want to write checks of, you know, if, if you make a billion dollars a year, you should be paying at least $350 billion. They don't want to pay $350 million. And so they get Congress people to write laws that favor their interests. And then if they can succeed in repealing the estate tax, they get a grand slam home run. All the benefits of being in America, none of the burden. I, I, I. I, I, I do understand that. I, I, and I, you know, I, I don't know that I would be much different if I was in their position. But I, I, I agree with you. I think we would behave like they do if we were the, their shoes. Oh, I hope not. I hope not. I, I just I just we're about we've got about 28 seconds, 27 okay. seconds uh, before the end of this. And we're, what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to have we're going to tape right now a second discussion. You're going to see this uh, um, a week later and then it'll be archived on the Web. And um, so we're going to close down this one. And, you know, that's just what I said, right? And, see you next uh, week. All right. So I'll see you next week. Uh, this is Lenore von Stein talking to David K. Johnson. Uh, this is The Facts. Uh, bye.